We are in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 this morning. If you'd like to open up to Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 11. So we, we started chapter 9 last week. Chapter 9 is focusing on Jesus. He is the, the greater sacrifice. Or, uh, he's, of course, the greatest sacrifice. But he, compared to the old law of sacrifices, he is the, the greater sacrifice. And so the first 10 verses were really focused on sort of showing us in the old tabernacle, the original tabernacle, uh, kind of some of the, the rituals and the things that went on and sort of building the case that if that happened in the old, then it must have spiritually happened then in the new. Yes, Hebrews 9 and verse 11. Hebrews 9, 11. And so that, that if you notice Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9, it says it, it was symbolic for the present time. And so we're picking up then in verse 11, and it really emphasizes that Christ's sacrifice is the sacrifice that we need. And so it says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. And so verse 10, he ended with the idea that, that those sacrifices would go on until the time of the Reformation. And so well, what is the time of the Reformation? Well, that's verse 11. He says that's when Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come. Now, that's not when Christ came to earth, because remember, on earth, Christ was not the high priest. He, he, uh, he didn't fill that role. And so this is talking about when he came into God's throne as a spiritual high priest. This is after his ascension into heaven. And that's what he describes in verse 11. He says, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of the creation, right? Not the physical tabernacle, but the spiritual tabernacle. And so he, he comes, uh, he's the high priest of good things to come, right? Good, it's, it's more than the bare minimum. It, it's, it's greater, uh, you could say, than the old. And, uh, and, and he comes to the one that is perfect, the perfect tabernacle. But that's the more mature, the more complete, right? and is the complete tabernacle. And so if he comes, though, he has to bring a gift. He has to bring a sacrifice, some kind of offering. And so verse 12 tells us what he brought. He came not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal uh, redemption. And so, right, not animal blood. Uh, he, he brought his own blood. And that's, you think about the difference there. An animal doesn't volunteer for the job. They get picked. An animal doesn't offer itself willingly or even knowingly. It doesn't know what's going to happen. It's just standing there doing whatever animals do. But he offered himself willingly. He knew he was going to have to offer himself. And so he entered, it says, the, the most holy place. He entered the, the very throne room of God where his spirit dwells. And it says he entered it once. And so it's not in and out like in the old law. The high priest went in quickly, got his stuff done, got out, right? He entered it one time, and he's there to stay. And he entered it for all people. And so it's it's such a great sacrifice that it's for every person on earth. And so this is the price, right? This sacrifice was the price to redeem us from our sins. And that's what he says, we have obtained eternal redemption. And so is that is that really so much better? Well, in verse 13, he says, if the blood of bulls and goats... And the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Now, it's not that, you know, that it wasn't really about sanctifying the flesh so much as when he says sanctifying the flesh, he's saying it's kind of like it's only skin deep, right? It just, it just rolls those sins back. There's not true forgiveness is kind of the idea there. But he says if, if, if it's just kind of skin deep, if it's just rolling it back, then verse 14, how much more, and that's one of his favorite phrases. Remember, we've seen that phrase, how much more. In chapter 2, we give the more earnest heed, we have to pay more attention than they did. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is why we give the more earnest heed, because we have the greater sacrifice, his blood, right? And it says, through his eternal spirit. And I think, I don't think that's so much an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. The emphasis there is 
his spirit is eternal. Right? Bulls and goat spirits, right? they have a creation point. They have a death point. But his spirit has always existed. And, and so there's, there's, a, a, there's an importance to that. I just got to start explaining more and more. And so, you know, he, he can cleanse eternally because he has an eternal spirit. And so, yeah, he, he offered himself without spot. He, he's a perfect, not just physically, but he's legally, morally, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, character-wise, he's perfect. And it says that he, he cleanses your conscience. Right? It's not just the flesh, but it's your conscience. Now, your conscience, that's that voice, you know, that, that gives you a little warning bell. That you probably shouldn't do that because this or that reason, you know, right? We understand what's right. We understand that we're cleansed and that we have only we have need of only Jesus's cleansing and so that he can bring us to something greater, right? Not serving dead works. We can stop serving sin, but instead he says to serve the living God. It kind of takes us back to chapter 4 and verses 12 to 13. You remember chapter 4 and verses 12 to 13 talks about the living word of God that will penetrate to the division of soul and spirit and so forth and that we'll all stand before him naked and open, and that he is the living God who's given us that word so that our consciences know just exactly how to serve him. And it's kind of the idea of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Remember 1 Peter 3, 21, he says, you know, you were, you were baptized. It's the answer of a good conscience, and that's that baptism saved you because your conscience understood and that it could be, it could be truly cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so verse 15, for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. This sacrifice makes him alone worthy. He's the mediator. Now, sometimes today when we talk about mediation, if you wanna hire a mediator, Usually what, what, what modern people do is, is, you know, if you have conflict between maybe people in, in business or something, they try to hire an unbiased, they call it an unbiased mediator. It's the idea that they have no stakes in either side, right? You don't hire someone's family member or something related to somebody, somebody who has no stakes in it. But that's not the idea of in ancient times of a mediator. In ancient times, what you wanted was someone who had equal stakes in both sides, someone who cared equally about both groups. And that takes us back to Hebrews 1 and 2. Why is it so important that the Messiah has to be both God and man? 100% both. Because that gives him equal stakes in both God's cause, so that he's never going to slight God, but also gives him equal stakes in our cause, so that he never is going to slight us either. He, he is the perfect mediator, because he knows 100% exactly what it means to be God, but he also 100% knows exactly what it means to be human. And so that's why he gets to be our media, our go-between. And he is the mediator of, again, this new covenant. We're, we're replacing the old one because it has greater promises. And so he says he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. Death is how we get to his, his death in particular. is how we get to this new covenant so that he can redeem Right, from for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant. He's going he's gonna to buy back the people whose sins have been rolled forward. In other words, they sinned in the Old Testament. They, they kept the Day of Atonement, and those sins were rolled forward and rolled forward until Jesus' death on the cross, so that then he could buy those people back. He could The ones who said yes in Acts chapter 2 and were baptized that day, they were baptized for their remission of sins, to have their sins washed away, right? all of those sins back and back and back and back and back to the time of Moses and, and beyond, they were all cleansed. They were all completely washed away so he could redeem all of those people. And, uh, and, and, but then if that's the case, then why are we still, why would they still need to practice the Day of Atonement? Because all of those people's sins had been completely cleansed now. They had been redeemed. They had been completely bought back. So we don't have a need for the Day of Atonement anymore. If he hadn't died, we'd still need to do it, or else there's sin, you know, we'd still have to keep rolling the sins forward, but we don't need that anymore. But as he says, it's, it's uh, uh, to those who are called, right, to those who believe, 
who answer his call and, uh, and, and to receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, right? That's the promise of resurrection and eternity. What does this modern day Jew do with this section that they cannot do those sacrifices anymore? Yeah, you know, I, the only way that I can, I can reason through how you could uh, believe that you are pleasing to God and still of the Jewish faith, not Christian, is to think of yourself as in sort of a Daniel situation where the temple is torn down and you think of yourself as in captivity of some kind, maybe not literally, but that, that you know, and that's, we kind of looked at that in the book of Ezekiel. God told me, he said, I'll be a little sanctuary to you wherever you are until the temple is rebuilt. That perhaps they're thinking of themselves in that light, which means they expect the temple to be rebuilt someday. And I've heard that too. Yeah. They, they that's the only way I can reason through how you could, how you could believe that that's right without having a temple or, but, but they must believe that God also is going to somehow bring back the records and everything. And so, uh, Carl. I was going to say the, the word mediator here that, that's used. Now, I'm wondering, I know in other places, and it may be in this one as well, is, is the word also can be translated as uh, advocate? Yes, yeah. Because I know in, in medieval times or in ancient times, an advocate a lot of times was the, had a relationship with the judge. And so when, right. when the advocate would testify for you, that judge knew that this person was honest. Yes. This person, this person wasn't giving a lot of un, untrue testimony right. about, about that person. So that's what. So you really wanted an advocate on your side, yes. so that the judge knew personally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and we still use it that way today. You think about like Costa advocates. You know, yeah. they, they have those relationships with both the kid and the judge to sort of mediate. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, I don't know, Sarah. Mm. Um, like different rabbis teaching and stuff mm -hmm. and so I think that's why you have like such a wide range of all different kinds of Judaism and, and they're really not so much following like just the Torah in a lot of those cases right it's, you know this <laughs> rabbi teaches it this way and they think of some of this stuff as more allegory yes than actual that's historical record. very true so, she's talking about some other you know that there's a lot of, of ancient and modern rabbis teachings that they've added to and that's a very common thing that Jewish people teach today is that the Old Testament is not a true story, that they're sort of allegorical. It, they're sort of made up stories that we're supposed to learn things from, like fairy tales, kind of. That's a very common teaching among Jewish people today. And so, I think yeah. they even do that in Jerusalem or in yeah. Israel yeah. today, because I've heard, you know, they've got almost as many different sects of, of the, the Jewish religion yes. as the, the rest of the world has got in that's Christianity. Right. And so for those people, they're not even expecting the temple to be rebuilt. They just they just think of it as moral stories to help them know how to live their lives. So, yeah. All right. Um, continuing then in verse 16, he's going to continue this idea that death is necessary, this sacrifice is necessary for there to be a new covenant, right? Where there is a testament. And when you see testament, right, think the words last will and testament. Right? Many of you probably have, have, have drawn up a last will and testament. That's the idea that he's talking about here. Where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. And so the testator is, is the person, this is the last will and testament of Earl Jones. You know, he's the testator. He, it's his will, right? And you think, will, this is what I want. This is my desire upon my death. That's kind of the idea that he's talking about here. None of those things take place until Earl Jones dies. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while he lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. And so he's saying that uh, even the Old Testament, right, there had to be a death before it could go into effect. Now, you know, whose death? Well, that's verse 19. He says, when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, right? And you think, testament, a will. Moses stood up and said, this is God's will. This is what he wants. These are his desires, his commands. He took the blood of calves and goats. And so who died to put the Old Testament into effect? Well, the, the, blood, the, the bulls and goats sort of stood in the place of, right? They died. And so he had water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself. And so he had to sprinkle the blood on those Ten Commandments, on those stone tablets. That's the last will and testament. 
of the Old Testament. And then also the people, the people had to be sprinkled by the blood. And so that's basically that blood binds them. He sprinkles the blood on the commandments. He sprinkles the blood on the people, and it's sort of like signing that contract. It's binding them together. It says, we agree to follow these commandments and to be bound by these commandments. And so he spoke and he said in verse 20, this is the blood of the covenant, right? The blood of the covenant, the blood that binds these things together, which God has commanded you. And, and that's the Old Testament was about purity. That's verse 21. Likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacles and all the vessels of the ministry. And so right, when they put the Old Testament into effect, he also had to sprinkle the, the things that they would use to, to worship God and to make sacrifices to God and to serve God. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so they had to purify all these things to remove sins, to make it holy and useful. And so that's what death, that's what the blood, that's what the covenant is about. Now, here's what's implied here. If Moses did it physically, Jesus must have done it spiritually in some way. And that's all of chapter 9. We keep seeing that. If Moses did it physically, it's a picture, right? He called it a parable. It's a parable of what Jesus did. And so starting in verse 23 then, Christ greater sacrificed, purified the greater covenant. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. He, he's reminding us there. Moses built his tabernacle, but it was always just a shadow, and the true tabernacle cast that shadow. It was always just a copy, but the true tabernacle was the original one that it's based off of. And so he had to purify with the blood of bulls and goats, but the heavenly things, or you could translate heavenly, the spiritual things, the true one, needed a better sacrifice than this. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but he's entered heaven itself to appear in the true presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, but uh, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Uh, but now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so right, it's the idea, if he was going to have to make the sacrifice over and over again, like they did in the Old Testament, he had to start with the first sin. He would have had to sacrifice himself with Adam and Eve and then do it every time that somebody sinned and came before him. He'd have to sacrifice himself over and over again. That's before the foundation of the world. But instead, right, this is the culmination of a long, brilliant plan. And that's this is what kind of brings the idea that, that when God commanded Moses to build the tabernacle, he was thinking about us still. He was thinking about Christ as the true high priest and the true tabernacle. He was thinking about all of this, everything that he did to lead up to that, everything that followed, it all was to get to the true tabernacle with the true high priest and the true sacrifice. There's this great, glorious plan, and, and, and he has appeared there now to put away sin. Now, put away, that's kind of the same idea as divorce, like to remove yourself from. And so... Sin is still an option. That's, that's very clear. But when he says puts it away, it's everyone who chooses only Jesus and his brilliant plan and his great sacrifice, right? Sin won't condemn you. Put sin away. Sin won't condemn you if you are following that Jesus. And so that's just like what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, he says, There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who walk in Christ Jesus. And that's, if we are sticking with him and repenting of our sins, then sin cannot condemn us. And, uh, and that's, that's what Jesus can offer us. The old law can't offer that. They just had to roll it forward. And it's so powerful that you're even secure in death. Verse 27, that is, as it is appointed for men to die once, right? and so anyone who ever tries to tell you that we get reincarnated, right? Right here, Hebrews 9.27, every man, every woman, every person dies once. You know, they say the only things that are, not in that, or that are inevitable in this life are death and taxes. 
There are people who don't pay their taxes. And there are people who will never die. We know that too. If Jesus comes back first, that's the exception to this. But other than that, every man is appointed to die once, and then after that, the judgment. After death, that's all that's left is the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. And so, uh, now here, eagerly wait for him. Eagerly wait for him. Why is that so important to the audience that he's writing to originally? What are What is everybody stirred up about? What are they all excited about in this time? Not Christ coming. Not At least not Jesus is Christ coming back. Yeah, they're, they're waiting on on to win a war against Rome. Yeah, they're they're expecting, as we said, some kind of angelic messiah to come <laughs> and to destroy the Roman Empire just like that. And and this is what everyone is stirred up and excited about. And he says, if you're excited about that, you've kind of missed the whole point, right? We are eagerly waiting, not for the Canaan land, which is what they were wanting, but for the afterlife. And that's why he mentions death here. We are eagerly waiting for, as Johnny mentioned, for Christ to come back. Now here he is talking about the second coming of Christ. He's saying where, where we won't be plagued by sin. He says that he's coming apart from sin. There'll be sin no more, but will be consumed in salvation forever. Uh, for salvation. That, that's what we're eagerly waiting for. And so he is the greater sacrifice. Because he has the greater tabernacle, his blood is greater, he has greater access to the Father, greater purification, uh, he can cleanse our sins completely, greater promises and a greater covenant, and a greater reward, eternity. And that's part of what makes him the greater sacrifice. And so the choice, again, is obvious. Choose Jesus. Melanie? Well, I just, um, I noticed in verse 24, uh, when he's talking about who is in heaven uh, appearing in the presence of God for us. So he's talking to God about me. He's yes. talking to God about you. Just like in 1 John chapter 2, yes. verse 1, where he says we have an advocate with the God. That's right. We have the advocate with the Father. That's right. Who is, <laughs> that, but same, same thought here. Right. right. Sometimes we kind of, if we're not careful, we can put that behind that wall. We forget that God is thinking about me. Mm-hmm. And God, Jesus is telling God about me. Hey, you know, don't forget about me. Right. You know? And so that, that ought to give us that little boost of, of just, you know, feel goodness. Mm-hmm. And, wow, i got to remember that, that God does care about me and all of this world. Yeah. Yes, like, yeah. But he also cares whenever I'm messing up. Mm-hmm. Jesus is there saying, but don't forget, she's been doing this too. She's working on this. Right. So, you know, that, that, does, mm-hmm. that does help. It does, yes, and that, that's a great point. She says in verse 24 that he appears in the presence of God for us. That's that's why he's there, and he is mediating about each of us individually in the presence of the Father. Loretta. Well, what Melanie just said there, you know, the messing up part, he messed up every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So sometimes those moments that we mess up are repeated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> think about Paul. What did Paul say about this? He did address that. He said, I do the things today I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I ought to do. And that's even to the point when he died. So that, that's where I get my strength from that idea. He only reaches that point if you don't repent it, if right. you just refuse to repent. And that's, what, did, what did Jesus tell Peter when Peter says, how often should I forgive my brother? Like seven times maybe? And, and you know, Peter's thinking like, I'm tired of forgiven this person and so seven times is pretty generous and then I can be done I can write that person out of my life and Jesus says 70 times seven which is not supposed to be you know like well once you've reached what is it 490 or something then but it's the idea of every time they come back to you and ask for forgiveness you forgive and so if Jesus expects that of us you can be sure God and God's patience is much greater than ours that if you are, if you, it doesn't matter if it's the same sin 
He repented over and over, and he fell back into it. If you're truly repenting and trying to get past that and doing what you can, he's going to forgive you of that every time. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yeah, anything. And you think like that sincerely, which Yeah. And you don't really give God time to do it. Mm-hmm. Every experience. person here experiences that. Every person here does. But the thought does this the messing up or the thought does come to my mind that he is just gonna say I I feel that way sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's how I would feel if I were him. That's but, not that's why God is not. That's right. Well, I'm so glad that I, you know, yeah, that he is God. I think we're all saved. Yeah. The only time you have to worry about that is if you start being unconcerned about it. If you just don't care anymore that you've messed up. That That's the only time your soul is in danger. But as long as you are repenting and trying, he forgives. John? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why John says, if, if you are willing to confess those things to God, He is faithful and just. He always forgives. So, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Carl, I was going to say it's uh, kind of dealing with the same thing. That they seem to have had these these uh, I guess uh, Jews here, these uh, Hebrew Jews, were having a, a problem with. Uh, the concept of Jesus, it looked like they were having a problem with the concept of Jesus cleansing our sin for ever. Right. Ever. And that they, and I think many of them, if, if I go back and I look at the history, I think many of them were still, these, these Christians were still giving sacrifice yes. to the temple. Some of them were probably still working still participating in the temple. In the, in a, they were still participating, in, and many of them were wanting to go back. I think that's why this was mm-hmm. written, is many of them were wanting to actually just go back to. To Judaism because they they just couldn't understand how this one sacrifice can mm-hmm. take care of of everything and I think we still struggle with that today how how does how does this one sacrifice mm-hmm. that Christ did uh, cover our sin and you know and based you know when Jesus maybe the last words he said uh, may not be but I think I think they were the last words he said. It's finished. Mm-hmm. Was that? I mean, I, I believe those were the last. I think so. Yeah. Said, Among you know, the it's last finished. Time. Yeah. It's done. Mm-hmm. And so we don't need to worry. I mean, we should worry about sinning, but we don't need to have to worry about the fact that our salvation That's is, right. is secure because it's, it's done finished. that work. That's right. It's yeah. done. It's done. And so we don't need to worry about what they were worrying about yes. going back and forth, doing the sacrifice, mm-hmm. making sure that I. Do all the Judaism type stuff. GW. Sometimes we probably don't realize where that uh, the Bible tells us pray often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If we just stop and think about that, mm-hmm. uh, it's wonderful. Yes, sir. Because God is wanting to get us to heaven. That's right. And if we don't pray often, I know myself and probably a lot of other people in here, they look at their life and they say, well, I'm coming up short. Yeah. Lord forgive me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. I mean he, he was he was a great guy, but he had struggles just like we all do. Yeah. I think that's one reason we're not ever given what his thorn in the flesh was. And I like to look at it all of us have a thorn in the flesh that we just butt our heads against day in and day out. Mm-hmm. And we've asked God to help us, and yet that that problem is still there facing us every time we get by it. But Paul was the same way. God right. says, 
you know, uh, <coughs> oh, and I'll say this, I don't want to repeat anything that's been said over there, but my hearing is not the greatest, sure. the way I've done said it, but, yeah. you know, uh, Jesus, when he was tempted, like we are, he truly knows that the evil one is so powerful. Yeah. And I think that's one reason uh, he probably our mediator because He's got I don't here. know. I think in my own mind, God Himself, God Himself, don't really realize the struggle that mankind has. Well, Jesus has certainly proven that He does know it. He's he does know. It. That's right. He's been there, and that's He's right. right there on the right hand side of God, and that's He right. can tell them, God. You may not, now I'll say this. God, you may not understand this, but I've been there. These people are having a hard time. Let's pray often. Let's make it where they can pray often. Yeah, yeah. And so that, yeah, those are those are really good thoughts. And Carl's right. It's a problem that they struggled with and we still struggle with. And that's why as we get into chapter 10, he's still talking about Jesus as that greatest sacrifice. Yes, sir. Well, I ran into a scripture this morning where the Corinthians were having difficulties uh, knowing when and struggling with that and so uh, Paul told them uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and 21 mm -hmm. and 22 yes sir that it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put a seal on us and given us his spirit as a guarantee In our hearts as a guarantee. All right. So um, back in Hebrews chapter 10, then it says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. And so the, the old covenant, in other words, it never had the potential to do that. Uh, the, the shadow sacrifices didn't complete us. And, and he says, well, how do we know that? Well, verse 2, he says, For then they would not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. And so here's the evidence, right? the continual nature, the fact that they have to keep going back and doing it over and over again. And then in addition to that, he says in verse 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And so even just in the, the idea that they use these blood of bulls and goats and keep having to do it should have clued them in. This isn't quite enough. And so that's why Jesus came to be that. Verse 5, it says, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And so now he's going to give us the scriptural evidence. And that's this is how he does it pretty much every section. He gives us sort of the logical evidence. Then he'll give us some of the scriptural evidence. And so here he's turning back to Psalm 40. And Psalm 40 is about the Messiah and how he trusts in the Lord. Right? He trusts in God. It talks about how he has a time of need. He, he prays to God about having victory over his enemies. And in the middle of that, he talks about um, his purpose for coming, why he has this need, why he has to have victory over his enemies. Psalm 40, he says, uh, he, he quotes this here, and it says, here's his purpose, a body prepared as a sacrifice. That's, that's why he came. And then, as it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7, to do God's will. And so... This was God's will for him to come with the body prepared to sacrifice. And so he explains that to us starting in verse 8. He says, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. And then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. 
Right? So in other words, he says, God never wanted us to need sacrifices. Right? That's, that's, he doesn't have just particular pleasure in sacrifices for sacrifices sake. Now, when, when they made those, it said it was a pleasing aroma, right? it covered the stench of sin. They did please him for that reason, but that's not what he wanted from the beginning. And so Jesus had to be sent then. But he came to bring something greater than those older sacrifices in verse 9. Behold, I have come to do your will, to be that sacrifice. And so, again, Scripture proves what he's been trying to say. And his sacrifice is greater because, verse 10, he says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It truly sanctifies it was only once. And so again, scripture proves it's not continuous and it covers all people. That's backwards and forwards. That's all around the world. It, it covers all people. And so kind of tying all of this together, starting in verse 11, he says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now, as he's writing this, the temple did still stand. It'd be a few more years before AD 70, and it would fall. And so he says, they're still over there. Basically, he's saying, they're still over there wasting their time. That's, that's what they're doing. They're still killing all these bulls. They're, they're still over there, and they're just wasting their time. Jesus, but, but this man, verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice of sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Right? Why are they wasting their time? Because Jesus finished his sacrifice, and now he's just waiting for the grand finale. Right? Now he's just waiting for that final victory to come. And that victory is ours. You know, as he says in verse 14, he says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now that's it's really interesting how he because he writes about it in two different ways. We're being sanctified. Right? That's a process. We're always becoming more like Christ. We're always becoming holier if we're moving in the right direction. That's something that's a continual process and, until the end. But on the flip side, he also says we, he has perfected. And so we, we are not perfect ourselves. We're still changing and growing. But from God's perspective, he says he has completed us. We are complete before God. How can we be growing still and also complete before God at the same time? Jesus fills the gap, yeah, because we're covered by his blood, because his sacrifice was great enough to do that for us. And so verse 15, he says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. But here's the next piece of evidence. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds. I will write them. And he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And so right, scripture confirms. Now it says the Holy Spirit confirms. The Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures. And so often when it says the Spirit confirms, it's especially if it quotes from the Old Testament after that, it, it's saying the Holy Spirit, through Scripture, proved this to us. And what he's actually doing here, he's re-quoting. We've already read this back in chapter 8. Remember in chapter 8, he quoted from Jeremiah chapter 31 to describe, you know, and Jeremiah 31 is the one that says, I will make a new covenant, not according to the ones that I made with them when, they were with, when the fathers were in Egypt. They're very specific, not the law of Moses, a brand new covenant. One where the people will, will know my laws and, and they'll do my laws. And he adds, verse 17, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, how often did they have to remember their sins in the Old Covenant? Once a year. Right? He just keeps bringing it up over and over again. They had to keep remembering it. How often will we remember it in the New Covenant? He doesn't remember. He chooses not to remember. They're as far as the east is from the west. Carl, I was say there was, you know, these these sacrifices there were, were all being done, and then it, it talks about the which are offered according to the law. In, in, in the Old Testament, there's several places where it, it's very clear that God was not pleased with them for a couple of reasons. Number sure. one, uh, they were just doing it 
to obey the law. That it had no had they were going no through the motions. Meaning. Yeah. It had no real meaning. They had lost the meaning of why they were sacrificing these these animals and mm -hmm. why they were sacrificing doing those sacrifices. And uh, also, I, for a large period of time, there were people, there were priests doing these sacrifices that shouldn't have been should not have been priests. Sure. And so, uh, so you know, not only were not only was it not being done in a correct way, but it was it it wasn't the people people were just doing it, and a lot of these people had no re, had no idea why they were doing it. They were just right. doing it because this is what the God said. God sacrificed animals. They were sacrificed animals. Yeah. Then he, much in the same way as the as the pagan world, most mm -hmm. of the pagan world, they had no idea why they were sacrificing these these things because they're that idol said or they thought that this you know sacrifice right and i think that's that's where it, it, it stopped becoming a, an issue of the heart and started becoming an issue of tradition and uh you know obligation obligation yeah yeah it brings up the question even up until christ's time the, the, the these priests were not they were appointed a lot of times by the romans right and things that were doing these sacrifices what did it do for those individuals who were trying to roll their sins forward and the, the wrong people were doing the sacrifices for them. I, I, I always yeah. wondered well, that, how did God handle that part of it? You know, and there were always moments in history where, where um, you know, they didn't even, you know, they closed the doors of the temple and right, they didn't right. even or didn't have a temple. And so the idea was it was it was generally rolled forward and, I, you know, I don't think God got pharisaical about like, except for these few sins here, they didn't right. do it those years, you know, and it was generally rolled forward through all of that time. And so uh, that's, it, it got them to Christ in the end. Yeah, but that's that's a good thought. Yeah, Sarah. One of the one of the things he's kind of addressing is that the people want control of of the sacred things. You know, sure. It's like, okay, I did this today, and then this is the bull I was going to sacrifice for that, and I did this, and, and I think we can kind of be that way too. Mm -hmm. You know, wanting to be able to keep that tally and kind of and control when our sins are remitted ourselves. And, and it, the point is, the bulls never took away the sins. Mm -hmm. It was never about the animal sacrifice. It's about you recognizing, I can't do anything about this sin and letting God do that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one of the things that he's getting at here is that it was never, we were never able to do anything about our own sin. Right. Even if we followed the law and made all the sacrifices, that wouldn't have done us any good. It's God that does it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. She, she's just pointing out that. Um, Often, you know, addressing a theme here of sometimes we want to feel kind of in control of the remission of, of sins, and that's you know we can kind of uh, I did this sin and then I sacrificed this bull and kind of keep those tallies and, and but even in a way we can kind of do that today in our own way, but but that in the big picture this this wasn't about you know like me doing this in order to have remission of sins. This is about I can't do it without God. And, and, and so even if we did it all perfectly in the Old Testament to make all the sacrifices, it didn't mean anything without God. And, and so that's, that's been, of course, true today that we can't do it without Jesus. They never could either. And so, yes, ma'am. So you talk about doing the best that sense wants to do. Just kind of make it easy. Then people did this and everything they did wrong and just confess. Well, and there, so there's, they, they actually made sacrifices all year. And you, you, you would bring, you know, if you had a particular sin that you needed to deal with, you would bring the sacrifice when you needed to do it. But they also had sort of a special day called the Day of Atonement. And that was, it wasn't about any particular sin. It was just sort of the, the whole thing, kind of all of those sins, things that we didn't even know we needed to repent of. All of those things sort of rolled up into one to, to represent the rolling forward another year of our sins, to, you know, holding off God's judgment another year. Yeah, that's a good question. But you would, you would, um, you know, they they made sacrifices every morning and evening, you know, like clockwork, and and then you could bring at any point, you know, uh, some of, some something of the for particular sins that you have. Some yeah. of the sacrifices had nothing to do with sin as well. That's true. Yeah. Some, some of them that they were, they were sacrifices that were that were done for uh, uh, out of joy or or uh, yeah. blessing, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, kind of and, yeah, and so on. And so Lots forth. of kinds of sacrifices. Not every so. sacrifice was. Right. Yeah. All right. So we'll wrap up today then in verse 18. He says, now where there is a remission of these, there is no longer uh, an offering of sin. In other words, 
if you've been completely forgiven, there's no need for Christ to be sacrificed again, and therefore there's no need for the temple any longer. And so next week we get into the very, my favorite very section of Hebrews, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, thank you so much for your attention today. We'll wrap it up there.